Okay. Um, so, hey everyone. Um, I'm Devansh. I'm uh, currently uh, pursuing my PhD in computer music at uh, the University of California, San Diego. And today I'll be talking about um, voice synthesis by analysis with uh, a specific focus on a study of physical modeling and source filter deconvolution approaches. Um, sorry, just a moment. Okay. So um, I'll first be talking, uh, giving an overview of the physical modeling philosophy and the philosophy behind the source filter deconvolution uh, for the source and filter components for an existing voice. Uh, I'll then be talking about vocal tract models uh, using uh, the piecewise waveguide model, uh, often commonly known as the Kelly Logbaum model, which is informed from the physical mechanics of the vocal production system. Uh, I'll then be talking about linear prediction coefficients or LPC analysis, which is a signal processing tool uh, that allows for the separation of the source and filter components in the source filter philosophy of voice. And then I'll be talking about the relationship between the piece, piecewise model and the LPC model. I'll then also talk about uh, glottal flow modeling, uh, specifically using the LF or the commonly used LF model. I'll then discuss some uh, state-of-the-art uh, techniques for glottal inverse filtering. Uh, I'll be discussing two broad categories of these techniques, uh, iterative methods and closed phased analysis. Uh, then I'll talk about the role of the lip radiation filter on the accuracy of these uh, inverse filtering techniques. And then we'll discuss some future scope. Uh, I'm actually not sure of how much time we have uh sorry my bad i forgot to ask that beforehand so if no worries, you have up to an hour to talk okay okay awesome yeah. so i should yeah should easily be able to finish all of this then okay thanks um so uh for the overview of the physical modeling technique in order to uh, produce a, a sound a vocal sound uh humans built an air a pressure at the base of the vocal folds uh, which causes the glottal folds to to open and uh, this opening of the glottal folds end up creating a, a tension in the glottal folds which kind of creates a force in the backward direction uh, there is also a pressure built at the base of the vocal tract so the balance of all these forces causes the vocal folds to oscillate in quasi in a quasi periodic fashion which is modeled often modeled using pressure controlled valves uh, this pressure this uh, oscillating pressure then passes through the vocal tract uh, which is modeled using a waveguide model which then passes through the lips uh, which is modeled using a lip radiation filter um, in reality, there is also a part of the uh, pressure wave that passes through the nasal cavity, but uh, the effects of the nasal cavity will be beyond the scope of our discussion today. Under the source filter philosophy, uh, we assume no coupling between each of the individual components uh, that we discussed previously. And when we assume that uh, a no coupling between each of the components, we can then uh, divide the speech signal or the voice signal as a combination of an excitation signal which is being filtered with a, a glottal flow filter which is uh, as shown here and then that gets multiplied with a vocal tract filter which then gets multiplied with a lip radiation filter giving us the voice output. Um, the idea of source filter deconvolution is uh, then 
to be able to separate a voice signal into its source and filter components. Um, the definitions of what the source is and what the filter is varies across different approaches and it's an important factor. But the, the main idea is if this is a, a typical frequency domain representation of a voice signal which consists of this uh, uh, this impulse train kind of uh, uh, a, a part of a, an impulse train and a spectral envelope to it. So there are some tools such as LPC analysis and capsule uh, methods which allow for the extraction of the spectral envelope from the signal. So in one of the assumptions for the source and filter, the source is assumed to be the excitation which is just the impulse strain and the filter is assumed to be a combination of uh, the glottal flow, the vocal tract and the lip radiation. So as you can see here, this is uh, E times G which also has a spectral envelope component to it which is actually corresponding to the to the G which is the glottal flow filter and then here we have the vocal tract filter and here we have the lip radiation filter so all these contribute to the spectral envelope and then the impulse strain is just the excitation so in the easiest way you can just run these signal processing tools that extract the spectral envelope and we'll get E or the excitation as the source and uh, the spectral envelope as a filter. But there are also these other sets of techniques which are sometimes known as glottal vocoding techniques and um, you the idea then is to be able to extract uh, individual components uh, even in between these components. So uh, in, in that philosophy then the filter corresponds to only the vocal tract and the source then corresponds to uh, the excitation and the glottal flow and the lip radiation. And then the lip radiation assumes certain assumptions which you can then use to then extract only the glottal flow as well. Uh, the glottal vocoding techniques are more aligned with the physical modeling of voice and they also allow more control over the parameters for the resynthesis as we will see further. Um, so just to give an overview of what the goal for uh, voice synthesis by analysis is, we want to be able to build vocal tract and glottal flow models. Uh, we then want to be able to analyze analyze a voice signal to extract the parameters for these models and then we want to be able to modify the parameters for these uh, vocal tract and glottal flow models as needed and then resynthesize the voice signal with the modified parameters so uh, with that goal in mind i'll first talk about uh, vocal tract modeling So uh, we mentioned that a uh, piecewise waveguide model is typically used for uh, modeling the physical vocal production, the physical vocal tract. Uh, a vocal tract has uh, changing areas. So uh, every time the pressure encounters a change in area, it uh, causes uh, a change in impedance and that change in impedance causes uh, the forward traveling wave to reflect and transmit through some reflection and transmission filters. When these sections are assumed to be cylindrical, uh, the reflection and the transmission uh, assumes a scalar value with, uh, which depends on the ratio of the areas of the sections which can be a, a single junction of changing area of vocal tract can be shown over here. And uh, each of these sections are then uh, uh, coupled with each other to get the whole of the vocal tract. 
uh, at the boundaries which is the glottis and at the lips uh, uh, the reflection and transmissions assume uh, some special cases so at the at the glottis the uh, there is no reflection uh, sorry th there is no transmission for the the backward traveling wave and only a reflection and the reflection is often assumed to be a uh, scalar at the lips uh, it it acts as a special case of an open tube where the reflection and the transmission functions are ampli amplitude complementary uh, with this in mind we can then form a relationship between the pressures entering and exiting the first section with the pressures entering and exiting in the last section or the mth section which can be given by this expression here which depends on uh, uh, the, the k values that we discussed um, the transfer function then can be uh, basically given as the the ratio of the output at this point here over the input at this point here and uh, this transfer function over here is a is it has these pressure components into it the pm plus and the p1 plus and p1 minus but then by using this relation between the pressures we can substitute these pressures to get rid of the pressure components and we could then obtain a transfer function for this vocal tract in for moving on to lpc analysis uh, linear prediction coefficient is uh, as we discussed before is it is a tool to extract the spectral envelope from uh, the from a voice spectrum but uh, the philosophy behind lpc is to estimate the a current sample as a linear combination of past p samples uh, and they are weighted by these alpha coefficients where p is the order of the lpc and alpha are the lpc coefficients if we then uh, find the error between the predicted signal and the actual signal uh, we can uh, differentiate the sum square of this error uh, and equate it to zero to solve for these alpha and that's how lpc coefficients are obtained uh, in the through the z domain representation of this error uh, we can also obtain a transfer function for the lpc which looks like this and uh, oh, an important characteristic of lpc transfer function is that it's an all pole model LPC also has an alternate representation uh, through using lattice filters where it has these k coefficients and mathematically it can be shown that these k coefficients are uh, directly related to the piecewise waveguide model that we discussed previously. Um, so to talk a little about the relationship between uh, piecewise waveguide and the LPC. So here's the uh, transfer function of the piecewise waveguide model and here's the transfer function of the of LPC. It can be shown, so in this uh, transfer function here, uh, the, the Z, uh, Z components are only present in in the denominator over here in inside this case there are no z components present over here except for this one z component which is which just corresponds to a pure delay so when the rl which is the reflection function of the piecewise waveguide is set to minus one then this lpc assumes an all pole structure and it makes way for it to be similar to the LPC under some more conditions that we'll see. But when RL is uh, is a filter, or if uh, when RL is an IIR filter, then 
when you replace that RL over here, it puts some zeros in the system and then it can no longer be uh, shown to be equal to the LPC model. So the primary conditions for piecewise waveguide and the LPC to be to be similar or, or the same are when RL is set to minus one, when RO is uh, set to the last LPC coefficient or alpha P, and when the order of LPC is chosen to be twice the number of uh, sections in the piecewise waveguide. So to confirm this, we also conducted some uh, experiments. Uh, so we first obtain a reference vocal tract impulse response using a piecewise waveguide model for uh, 22 sections. Uh, in the case one, uh, we set RL for this reference vocal tract to be minus one. And in cases two and three, we use a filter RL, which is a more realistic representation for the vocal tract. We then obtain LPC coefficients for the reference vocal tract impulse response. In cases one and two, we will set the order for the LPC to be uh, twice the number of sections, which is 44. And in case three, we will set it to be a little greater than uh, twice the number of sections. Using the uh, obtained LPC coefficients, we then obtain the area function for another uh, piecewise waveguide model. Uh, we note that the new area function obtained using LPC coefficients assumes a half sample delay between sections. And we then resynthesize the uh, new piecewise model. Uh, to account for the half sample delay, we use uh, uh, twice the sampling rate and only use one fourth of the, of the spectrum. And uh, we again set the piecewise waveguide to have uh, parameters RL as minus one and RO as uh, the last uh, LPC coefficient. So that was just the mathematics, but to uh, kind of make sense of what I was discussing previously, this is the first case when you set the piecewise waveguide model to have an RL of minus one and you use the LPC order of 44, then you see, we see here that uh, all the three spectrums obtained are exactly the same. So this is the spectrum of the original piecewise waveguide model. This is the spectrum of uh, the LPC. And this is the spectrum of the new piecewise waveguide model obtained through this LPC. And they're the exact same. And we can also hear that they sound the exact same. Uh... In the case two, where we used uh, a filter RL, which is a more realistic version of the waveguide model, and then we used LPC order of 44, we see that the LP LPC is no longer able to exactly uh, give us the, uh, uh, the frequency response of the waveguide model. Uh, the, the reason being that this waveguide model now not only has poles, but also has some zeros. And LPC being an all pole model, it only approximates that. And we see that it loses some of the information here, which is also clear from uh, the audio over here. So this is the original piecewise waveguide model with filter RL. Uh... And this is the Opt one obtained using LPC. So these are clearly like different sounding and but once we have obtained the uh, LPC coefficients we can then resynthesize another piecewise waveguide model by setting RL as minus one uh, and RO as the last LPC coefficient, and we get the same exact same frequency response as the LPC, but it is no longer the same as the original uh, piecewise waveguide model. And 
we also see here that the area function obtained so oh sorry i think i've missed to show this in the previous case so this was the original area function uh used in in case one which was exactly the same as the area function obtained using lpc but in this case now when we use an lpc uh when we use a filter rl we are no longer able to obtain the original area function that was used to uh, create the reference vocal tract to counter this frequency response problem we can then in can I, sorry can i ask a question while we're yeah sure uh, why no, 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 why no, do yeah. you why do we want them to be the same what is the purpose of it uh the area functions or the no, spectrum the, the, the spectrum so uh okay i okay so so this is uh, the the original piecewise waveguide model is something that we are using to create a reference signal so uh in reality we would want to extract the um spectrum spectral envelope of uh, a real voice signal but it has all these different components. It has like the glot glottal flow and it has a reflection filter. So just to be able to emulate that, we first create this reference signal using a piecewise waveguide model, which is directly influenced or directly uh, derived from the actual voice signal. So assuming that this is the true voice signal, we want to be able to obtain the exact same frequency uh, response using LPC. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, and uh, the area functions, so typically uh, LPC is often used in some research to also uh, estimate the vocal tract area function and we show here that uh, it does not actually give you the area function but only gives you the area function for an uh, equivalent piecewise waveguide model uh, for the frequency response though we can then increase the order of lpc to something higher which is the third case so here we set the order of lpc to 52 and we are able to get a close enough frequency response it's still not exactly the same here the first peak is smaller than the second but in the estimated one the second peak is smaller than the first but they sound pretty similar so here's the reference so we were able to get back uh, or uh, using lpc of a higher order we were able to get back the frequency response which is close enough and at least perceptually so but we're still not doing a good job with the area in fact uh, so the original piecewise waveguide had 22 sections and now assuming a half sample delay uh, we have 52 sections in the first case we got 22 sections and 44 so we can see that the length of both these vocal tracks is exactly the same but in this case now, even though we have gotten the same frequency response, uh, we have now essentially obtained a vocal tract which has a, a greater length than the actual vocal tract used in, in the production of the voice. So in conclusion of this particular section, uh, it's often assumed in the literature that the LPC order may be chosen to be twice the number of expected uh, sections in the original vocal tract or is often known to be uh, directly dependent on the length of the vocal tract but we show that this assumption doesn't necessarily hold true due to the presence of a filter RL in a filter reflection uh, uh, filter at the lips which introduces zeros in the system and should be taken into account um, also we saw that uh, lpc is often used to obtain the area function for the vocal track and we see that uh, it's not a direct uh, function but 
more work would be required to be able to obtain the uh, true area function if you want to use LPC to do the same. Um, I can maybe like before moving on to the next part, clutter flow modeling, if anybody has any questions, I am happy to answer those because it's the end of one section. So just for me, maybe, uh, uh, are we trying to use LPC because it's easier to handle uh, um, than the original model or what, what's, or just because it's been used more often and there is more? We are using LPC because we want to be able to extract uh, the filter coefficients or we want to be able to extract the spectral envelope from an actual voice signal. So the piecewise waveguide model only gives you a synthesis model, mm -hmm. but it doesn't give you uh, the possibility to extract uh, any parameters or any features from an existing voice. And LPC is one of the methods to do that. There's also, there are also capstral techniques, which uh, also allow you to obtain the spectral envelope. But um, first, I think the reason why capstral uh, methods are not commonly used are, we'll see in the glottal inverse filtering techniques that uh, it's easier to use LPC in that sense, and also because LPC holds this strong correlation with piecewise waveguide model. Okay, thank you. Makes sense. I would have a question. What is the typical order of LPCs in practice, like for speech synthesis, for example, for singing? So, it's often uh, noted in the literature that you select the order to be twice the length of the vocal tract. And when you're using a sampling, so in terms of the sampling frequency, it often comes out to be uh, the sampling frequency over 1000 and plus two or something. So if you're using a sampling rate of 16,000 hertz, then you would use uh, uh, the LPC order to be around 16 to 18. And for a 44, kilohertz sampling rate, you would use 44 plus two, like 46. But that's what's suggested in the literature with an assumption that uh, a typical male vocal tract is of 17 centimeters. But uh, that's what we are trying to show here that uh, if we follow that, we are not actually going to get accurate LPC results because uh, even if we assume that, even if we, uh, are true to the assumption of the vocal tract estimation, which is like uh, 17 centimeters, you would, we would still need a higher order than just sampling rate by thousand because of the presence of this, the filter RL. So if you ask me, I would say that for a 44 kilohertz sampling rate, assuming that the vocal tract is 17 centimeters, then you would need around 50, to 56 uh, as the LPC order. Does that answer your question? Thank you, yeah. Thanks. Can I add something to that, please? Yes, please, um, please. Go ahead. If I look at the LPC model simply as a model to fit the spectral envelope, and I make the rough assumption that I'm interested only in the formant frequencies, mm -hmm. And let's say I'm, I'm interested in the first four or five formants, mm -hmm. and each of the formants can be represented by one pole. Right. So why would I be interested in this fine structure where you, you showed an example where you had the splitting up of one of the resonance peaks in the mm -hmm. low frequencies. How relevant are they? And in other words, what is the influence of noise? Because I don't want to extract the noise from the signal. I only want to extract, let's say, the formant frequencies. Yes, I think that's a very good question. Um, so in this case here, so I agree that there's right now, there's no noise in the system. This is just uh, the impulse response of the vocal tract. So it has, it doesn't even have any glottal flow influence in it. It's purely vocal tract. But even if, even in this case, even if we were interested in only the first few 
form and frequencies. Then we see here by uh, taking the LPC of the order 44, we have lost information of the first frequency. So uh, first, like the, the if we are only interested in the first few form and frequencies, then the typical approach would be to first low pass the signal uh, to whatever uh, frequency you wanted to and then uh, run the LPC analysis. But even in that case, we would see that if we are using a wrong LPC order, we would uh, not obtain this first formant, first two formants accurately. Um, we cannot obtain uh, only the first few formants by just taking a lower order LPC for the entire signal because we'll just get an approximate for the entire uh, spectrum. Does that mm -hmm. answer your question? Yeah, I see. So if we want only the first few formants, then we would first low pass the signal and then run LPC for an order which is relevant for that sampling frequency. Yeah but we would still need it to be a uh, sufficient order to get this detail. If there are no other questions, I'll, I think move on to glottal flow modeling. Okay. Um, so for, for uh, the modeling of the glottal flow, uh, in the physical approach, there is a couple coupling between the vocal tract and the glottal flow so this is uh, typically one of, like one of the representations for the glottal flow modeling in the physical uh, approach so there's a pressure uh, coming from the lungs which opens this uh, glottal folds which uh, so this opening of the glottal folds, as we saw, uh, cause a tension in this in this spring, which is uh, this is uh, modeled using uh, a valve, and so the tension in the spring and the pressure built at the base of the vocal tract, along with this actual original pressure built at the lungs, uh, cause like uh, forces in opposite direction and causing this quasi periodic uh, oscillations of the uh, of the valve which is uh, represented as the vocal track uh, or the vocal folds and we see here that there is coupling between this pressure here and the, the, the pressure at the uh, lungs and in general modeling of this kind of a system is extremely sensitive to to the parameters and the parameters being the the mass of the vocal folds, the uh, length of the vocal folds, and uh, it's just very difficult to tune it to musical parameters. It's not only sensitive in terms of uh, setting it to the uh, relevant fundamental frequency, but slightest change of the parameters just causes the system to uh, become unstable. And which is why sign some signal based approaches came to the rescue. And uh, the first thing that the signal based approaches do is they assume no coupling between the, the filter or the vocal tract and the glottal flow. Uh, but they are very easy to tune to musical parameters. Uh, so if this is a uh, system for vocal production system where there's glottal source or glottal flow which then passes through uh, an nth order uh, all pole vocal tract filter and then passing through uh, a lip radiation if we assume no coupling between each of these parameters this lip radiation can then be brought back and then the glottal flow can be combined with the lip radiation to obtain what's known as the derivative glottal flow which is commonly modeled using some models uh, such as the LF model or KL glot 88 uh, model. And uh, these are these basically model the glottal flow along with the lip radiation for us. So to discuss 
more about the LF model. So this is uh, an LF a model flow, but this is the derivative LF model. And it has some parameters uh, such as, so TP is the instant of maximum glottal flow over here. Uh, TE is the instant of first contact of the glottal uh, of the vocal folds. So when the vocal folds open and then the vocal folds close, the moment the uh, vocal folds just start to close that's where that's the time te ta is the projection of this minimum of the derivative glottal flow uh, and where it inter intersects with the the time axis over here this is ta and tc is the instant of complete closure of the glottal flow so uh, an lf model can be uh, built using these timing parameters so and these timing parameters kind of define the the quality of the voice whether it's more tense or if it's more uh, like breathier uh, there was there's also a transformed LF model which was then proposed which just takes a single parameter RD which varies between 1.4 to 2.8 and it just uh, depending on that parameter it adjusts these timing parameters so just to give uh, a listening example of how changing these lf uh, parameters uh, change the quality of the voice this is an original signal and this is synthesized using an rd of 1.4 and when RD was set to 2.8 so we can see that the vocal texture has kind of changed between the two uh, in reality we would also need to add aspiration noise which is not yet uh, Im implemented in this system but uh, just to give an idea of how why the LF model is uh, a, an important model and how we can use it to vary the vocal texture. Uh, in the frequency domain, the LF can model. I ask a quick question, sorry. Oh yes, sorry. What does yeah. LF stand for? It's it's the name of the of the scientist. Uh, uh, F stands for Fant. L stands okay. for I'm not able. I I'm unable to pronounce the name. Sorry, but. Yeah. Okay. Not fine. Thank you. Um, so in the frequency domain, uh, LF model can be represented by just three poles uh, or it, it basically has, it consists of two parts. One is the glottal formant, which is uh, represented by these uh, conjugate poles. And then we have the spectral tilt. So the opening phase of uh, is defined as, or the open phase is defined as when the glottal folds remain open or until when the derivative glottal flow reaches its minimum. And then the, the closed phase is this uh, closure, as to, uh, which represents how, how smooth the closing of the glottal folds are. And uh, depending on where this uh, point FST lies, it decides how much of the higher frequencies are present in the flow so the the more abrupt the closure is the uh, further down the line in the frequency spectrum this fst will lie which will mean that it has lesser higher less less attenuation of the higher frequencies and this fst is directly related to the ta parameter in this lf model here which kind of defines the smoothness of the closure. Uh, so moving on to the glottal, some glottal inverse filtering techniques. Uh, I'll be discussing uh, an iterative approach first. Uh, 
in these uh, iterative approaches, uh, as we saw, the glottal flow consists of glottal, uh, glottal formant component and spectral tilt component. So the main idea behind these iterative approaches, um, actually before uh, before that, just to uh, give a, a motivation as to why this is needed. So we want to be able to remove, uh, we saw that there are signal processing tools that allow for the extraction of the spectral envelope from the voice spectrum. But then we also sa saw that we, we would want to uh, remove the influence of the glottal flow and the lip radiation from the spectral envelope of the voice so that the spectral envelope purely corresponds to the vocal tract. Uh, then the obtained vocal tract can be used to inverse filter the voice signal to obtain the residue which then corresponds to the glottal flow or, or the source. The problem is that it's, it's difficult to estimate uh, the flow without knowing what the filter was and it's and vice versa so it's like it's kind of a two variable but one equation kind of a problem where you don't know either the source uh, you don't know either the flow or the vocal tract so how do you estimate uh, each and which is why then uh, most approaches kind of make an assumption for what the glottal flow would be like and in this iterative adaptive uh, filtering techniques the assumption for the glottal flow is that it's uh, it consists of this glottal formant and the spectral tilt uh, parts and in the standard IAIF it doesn't take into account the spectral tilt at all it only takes into account the glottal formant so it first inverse filters the signal with a single order LPC the single order LPC uh, then estimates that uh, glottal formant and then it inverse filters the signal with that obtained LPC to obtain just the filter component and it does this iteratively to uh, just obtain like more fine or more truer version of the assumed estimation. Uh, but since the standard IAIF did not take into account the spectral tilt, the iterative optimal pre-emphasis model was introduced, which then over here, it after taking the LPC of the first order, it, uh, so it first takes an LPC of the first order and then inverse filters the signal, but then it does this iteratively until the alpha values of the LPC coefficients are below a certain threshold, what this multiple LPC analysis of first order does is that it kind of uh, assumes uh, that the vocal tract is maximally flat and it assumes that the all the spectral tilt in the spectrum of the voice is corresponding to the glottal flow and the lip radiation and assumes the vocal tract to be maximally flat. But that is not necessarily a, a, a true assumption. Uh, the vocal tract can also have, can also contribute to some of the spectral tilt, which is why the uh, glottal flow modeling GFM IAI have technique was then introduced, which then assumes the glottal flow to be, as we saw in the previous case, a third pole, a three pole model. So it follows this IOP technique, but it only does it thrice. So running LPC three times, hence obtaining a third order LPC, uh, which is assumed to be the estimation for the glottal flow. Note that uh, a third order LPC is different from running LPC successive, a first order LPC successively three times, because a third order LPC would just give you three poles or three peaks in the system but doing an iterative first order LPC three times would give you three different poles but not like a, a single three different peaks. Um, so just to uh, more uh, uh, exemplify the motivation behind using this model 
uh, I have some sound examples here where this is the original signal. This is uh, a signal obtained by uh, running the GFM IAIF algorithm on it to obtain the corresponding uh, source and the filter components. In so in this case, I have used I first used the GFM IAIF technique to obtain the vocal track for the signal, and then I used an LF model with with my own parameters to resynthesize this. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, using the direct LPC on the actual signal without using GFM IAIF technique, but I'm still using the LF flow. So we see here that since this was direct LPC the uh, for the filter, then uh, the filter contained information of the glottal flow already. And then if I used an LF flow on top of that, I'm kind of using the glottal flow effect twice, and which is why it kind of gives this low pass characteristic. And this is the third most direct case where you just take the LPC and then use an impulse train to excite the uh, obtained filter. Uh... So quality wise, uh, this one and this one are similar, but the advantage of using this technique here is then I have control over the parameter of my synthesis because I'm using an LF model so I can vary the parameters for my resynthesis. Um, are there any questions over here? I'm not sure I was very <laughs> clear here. Okay, I'll just... Sorry, I'm, I'm just kind of trying to come up with a question because the, I was using the LF model in the modeling I did a while ago, my PhD, and I remember and I was probably using just the standard EIF. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember it being quite difficult in terms of having to look at very short uh, time span of a signal uh, and also being quite sensitive to, to any parameterization. Uh, so does uh, your approach kind of help with that, solve it, or is it still the case? I think it is It, it, it is still the case. So right now, uh, that's a future step for me to be able to uh, obtain the parameters for an, for the LF model from an actual voice. Right now, the parameters I'm using for the LF model are just straight up, like just randomly chosen. Okay. Uh, the motivation I'm trying to uh, state here is that it's often, at least like even for me, when I started doing this, I was unaware uh, of this, I this idea that by just computing LPC, on this signal, or even if you just do a, a simple pre-emphasis to the signal, and then if you just do the LF, uh, the LPC analysis, then you cannot use a glottal flow model on top of that. Because when you're doing that LPC analysis, you are also extracting the flow in it. So the only way to resynthesize then is to use uh, an impulse train for the excitation. And by using uh, iterative adaptive filtering techniques such as these, you can first uh, de-influence the effects of the glottal flow from the signal to get purely the vocal tract. And then you can use your model for the glottal flow and just providing more control over the resynthesis that way. Okay. Isn't that the same as pre-whitening the signal before you would do the LPC analysis, because in this case, you would not remove the, the glottal signal. Uh, the, the motivation actually here is to remove the glottal signal in this case. I'm not sure what pre-whitening is. It's not that a term I've heard you would before. Add, uh, 
uh, noise to the signal so that overall the spectrum would be flat. So what you would see would only be the, let's say, the, um, the glottal signal so that you would have the, the resonance frequencies. Uh, everything from your all pole signal. But because you are the, the spectrum goes down with higher frequencies, mm -hmm. you're also modeling this with the LPC, which is right. not your intention. So if you would would add a, a colored noise, this is some, I'm, I'm a seismologist uh, from background, and we are having the same problem as you to deconvolve the individual parts of the of the source signal and the propagation medium, etc. And there we can use sometimes uh, pre whitening in order to to push up the high frequency part of the spectrum. Then we mm -hmm. have only the the resonance peaks, which we then can remove or analyze with an LPC filter. Yeah, I think uh, it's that makes sense, and because that's when pretty much. When you're driving the the direct LPC with an impulse train. You're driving the LPC filter with a wide spectrum, essentially. Right. So that's why I I, I assume that it might be the, very similar if you would just pre-whiten the spectrum and then just do an LPC analysis. But I'm not sure. This is just guessing. I mean. Yeah, it could be similar. I mean, they, this, these techniques are essentially trying to do the same, but so they are trying to estimate what the glottal flow would be. And so they're, so in, in the, I, uh, the iterative optimal pre-emphasis method, they are essentially doing the same where, where they are trying to maximally flatten the, yeah. the signal, but that's not necessarily true because there, there, it's possible that some of the spectral tilt still corresponds to the vocal tract, and which is why the GFM IAIF technique was introduced, where then they just do it, they only assume the glottal flow to be a third order uh, filter, and they only remove uh, enough spectral tilt, and not like remove the whole of the spectral tilt to model the vocal tract. Yeah, thank you for uh, letting me know of this, the, the pre-whitening technique. I'm going to look that up. Anyway, so uh, there's also an alternate approach that people uh, use for uh, ex to extract the vocal tract from the voice spectrum, which is known as the closed phase glottal inverse filtering. Uh, so under this uh, category, voice signal is assumed to have no influence of the flow during the closed phase of the glottal flow. So in this small phase here between when the derivative glottal flow reaches its minimum until it kind of closes. So in this small part, it's, considered, it's assumed to have no uh, influence of the glottal flow at all. So if an LPC analysis is done in only this small duration, then you are likely to get the only the vocal tract in that LPC analysis. Uh, the advantage of this uh, approach is that there's no need to make an assumption for the glottal flow. But uh, and on top of that, the analysis is not sensitive the to the fundamental frequency. So in the previous approaches, that's one point I forgot to mention. Uh, the analysis is very sensitive to the uh, fundamental frequency that was used for the actual voice production. Because if it's a, a higher frequency sound, then you are just not, if it's higher fundamental frequency sound, then some of the components of the vocal tract are just going to be absent in there. So it's harder to uh, estimate the vocal tract, but in this case, it doesn't make any such assumption uh, and it is not iterative, but then it also has its own cons. Firstly, uh, we need to be able to uh, accurately estimate these glottal closure instants, uh, which are generally done in the time domain. Uh, we have too few samples here then to compute the LPC, which are not always enough. Uh, sometimes, I mean, uh, in the L there are two ways for the two kind of implementations for LPC. One is the autocorrelation, 
and one is the covariance technique. Uh, in typically, the autocorrelation technique is used, but covariance LPC could be used when we have like lesser samples. But it's still not enough when the fundamental frequency again goes higher uh, because the number of samples are just too low. So in a sense, it just seems like if you have a higher uh, pitched sound, then it's not possible to extract the uh, true vocal tract because it just doesn't have enough information. And so just an insight, which probably aligns with uh, what Frank was also suggesting, which is a whitening of the signal is uh, if we use a whispered sound to do our analysis, it gives us the, it would give us a truer vocal tract and it could essentially be used as uh, a way to like, if, if the future step is to use machine learning to do some analysis and synthesis, then uh, whispered sound could be a good data set to learn the vocal tract. Uh, just a Can I just make a comment here? Of course, yeah. Um, couldn't you use the slope of the spectrum in this case? Because uh, there is a relationship between the shape of the closed face and the slope of the high frequency part of your spectrum so it mm -hmm. would actually help you to get a model for the for this what you call return phase because that's actually and you mentioned that earlier that i think that you have that this determines what exactly here this mm -hmm. from this plot you this have the FFS, fst mm -hmm. this frequency this corner frequency is determined from this small closed phase is this mm -hmm. right? Yes. And this slope, which is afterwards, is mm -hmm. related to the. If you go, if you go on with your slides, please. Uh, further ahead. One more. Yes, to here. This is related to the shape of of this return phase here. There is yes, a over here, right? The relationship mm -hmm. uh, coming through the Laplace transform for causal mm -hmm. signals, so for the unilater uh, unilateral Laplace transform, where you can see that you can actually model this shape if you know the slope of the high frequency part of the spectrum. I see. So maybe this would be something which could be helpful for you. Yeah, I think that's a good uh, insight to know and to look into. I can thanks, tell you the references if you are. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. yeah Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your comments. Yeah, it's really insightful. Okay. Um, so yeah, just a few comments as to uh, the importance of uh, the lip, uh, the lip radiation on these inverse filtering techniques. So in the iterative techniques, over here, I'm sorry, I'm going between slides here, but over here, uh, to estimate the lip radiation, they are using these integration blocks here. All of these integration blocks are basically uh, doing the inverse of the lip radiation. And the assumption here is that the lip radiation is just a single order uh, or a, or a leaky derivative filter or a single order high pass filter, uh, which is why the inverse of that is then assumed to be an integration. But in these experiments, in, we conducted some experiments to show that this direct assumption of an integrator for the, uh, or the derivative for the lip radiation is not necessarily accurate. So for that, we used a piecewise model with a dynamic flow. So uh, basically just uh, made a reference voice signal using the physical approach approaches and using a filter RL. So trying to make this model as uh, close to the actual voice production system as possible. And then we ran the GFM IAIF analysis on the original signal. But we did that with the original integrator blocks and also uh, with 
a more informed lip radiation inverse filter and we plotted the obtained vocal tract filter and also the obtained glottal flow waveforms um, and we see here that when when using integrator in the gfm iif technique it lesser gets rid of the the spectral tilt uh, this is the original uh, uh, spectrum of the vocal tract and this is what you obtain the red one when integrator blocks were used and the yellow one is what you obtain when a uh, more informed lip radiation inverse is used and similarly in the glottal flow uh, obtained we see that this red one which is the one obtained using the integrator blocks we have these spikes that are present here which which means that some of the information uh, which was a part of the vocal tract has been uh, estimated in the glottal flow but in the yellow waveform it's which is the one using the true inverse uh, lip radiation these spikes are not present so just a motivation that uh, more research is probably necessary to uh, carefully choose the lip uh, radiation or the inverse lip radiation when using uh, the GFM IAIF technique or any any technique for that matter uh, to estimate the glottal flow and the vocal tract. Um, and I think, yeah, just some future scope. So I I'm I I think this the the vo voice uh, synthesis model is still incomplete. Uh, there's still I still need to add aspiration noise to it. Uh, and then estimating, like we discussed before, uh, there's, there's still more work to be done in estimating the LF uh, model parameters from the ex from the extracted flow. Uh, this would kind of give a more complete analysis by resynthesis model. But then uh, a more uh, important forward future path that I'm looking into and I'd like I'll be happy to, uh, if anybody would want to collaborate and finds interest is in this area here where I feel like with this informed uh, voice model, uh, it can like this kind of a voice model could then be used to develop uh, deep learning models for uh, singing voice synthesis. Uh, so. It, in the literature that I've seen, in the kind of limited literature that I've seen so far, most of the singing synthesis, uh, it either generate uh, directly learns the the time domain signal using approaches such as WaveNet, or it uses uh, or it learns parameters for uh, some vocoder such as the world vocoder, which is uh, which is a mixed signal, mixed excitation with spectral envelope vocoder, wherein it assumes that the filter is uh, a combination of all the glottal flow vocal tract and the lip radiation and the source is just the excitation uh, and it was used in uh, w gansing i think uh, pritish had given a talk uh, previously in this uh, series in in this community earlier on his w gansing paper but uh, i think using glottal vocoding technique such as these uh, and using deep learning models to actually synthesize uh, the vocal tract and the glottal flow separately would give more control over the resynthesis because if we want to resynthesize the voice with varying parameters using any of the models such as WaveNet directly or uh, using the world vocoder then the only way to synthesize uh, voice with varying uh, vo vocal textures is then uh, by uh, having more data set that has the corresponding voice with uh, the corresponding vocal texture but by using glottal vocoding techniques such as these we can then vary the texture after we have synthesized and then we can also use uh, this uh, information to learn some more informed latent representations for voice um, and I'm just going to go a little quickly here because it's I'm already about time. 
Um, so uh, yeah, and, and then the last point is uh, Im an important point, which I think Paulina also mentioned, like I should talk about is how this can be used. I mean, I, I want to use this to analyze Indian classical singing voice to look for peculiarities uh, in both. I, I suspect that the peculiarities of an Indian classical singing voice uh, may lie both in the vocal tract as well as the glottal flow. So by using this analysis, it will be interesting to see if I can find some peculiarities because uh, there's there's a lot of work in, uh, for example, in the singer's formant uh, being present in Western classical singing voice. I don't think that is necessarily true in the Indian classical singing voice because it, it just has a different uh, uh, texture to it. So I'd like to use this at some point to use this work to find such peculiarities in, in the Indian classical singing voice. And I think, yeah, that's pretty much what I had. So yeah, please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you so much and super interesting. Uh, I have uh, an immediate question on the uh, Indian singing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, so you use the word peculiarities. Uh, not sure uh, what I would this kind of would use this kind of word. So you were suggesting to compare it to uh, um, Western classical singing. You're saying is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think uh, I, th I I don't know a d direct answer to it. I think, but probably like by comparisons to Western classical singing and also like to some other uh, forms of singing. Uh, so one direct way for it for for my analysis would be for me to uh, so I am I'm a vocalist myself so uh, although I'm I'm trained in Indian classical so I don't think I'll be able to emulate the Western classical uh, vocal production as accurately but it could be close to it so just analyzing my own voice and singing the same vowel sound and trying to see if there is any peculiarity uh, or anything that I can see in the frequency. So the, the information is definitely going to be present in the frequency domain representations. So uh, by looking at the vocal tract and the glottal flow, uh, frequency domain responses, there might be some something there that could be seen. <laughs> Yeah, it's very easy to, to get accused that you're not singing proper Western classical. Uh, so be prepared for this yeah. kind of critique. Uh, OK, so I, I can, from my point of view, I can say what I would consider interesting work in that direction. Uh, when I was doing it, my original hope was to um, uh, to learn to classify different um, configurations, physiological co configurations of vocal tracts and, and uh, vocal techniques which are related to that. Uh, in particular, I was looking at it trying to model Sundberg's phonation modes. Uh, and that I, I created a data set for it, so you're more than welcome to use it if. Uh, you, know, oh. you find it in any way useful. Um, but generally looking at this, I w I'm wondering how far you can get on the way of modeling the form of the vocal tract from the signal and whether you can using machine learning to actually get to better estimation of that uh, compared to what is out there. Mm -hmm. That would be absolutely amazing. So if if you can kind of make serious progress on the way of estimating the form of the vocal tract, that mm -hmm. there will be takers for this work, no question. I mean, uh, someone who looked at it in much detail was uh, David Hallward. And he, act I don't know if you know his work, he created uh, an app actually, an application which was supposed to be doing that. Uh, it was uh, quite a while ago, I think, 
maybe I don't know 30 years ago, 20 years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, more than 20. That was certainly 20th century. Uh, but he, uh, in the end, decided against releasing it uh, because his point was that he cannot uh, vouch for the uh, output. So. Uh, this model can produce states which are impossible for a vocal tract. Or sometimes you cannot decide which of the states uh, are correct, uh, right. produced by the model. And if uh, singing tissues get that in their hands, the, or, or singers say, mm -hmm. that, that can lead to serious harm. So if you could do better, say, than him, uh, that certainly would be of interest. I don't know, again, if you know the work of uh, Ingo Tietze, I would assume you would. Yeah, I've, I've, you, yeah. If, yeah, I've seen a little of his work. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that is kind of my area of interest, because uh, that is something that not only be of will be of interest for teaching singing and for the singers to work on uh, achieving better sounds uh, like mm -hmm. with more feedback on what they're actually doing because you can't look inside you know as a right. singing as a singer as a singing teacher you have no way of actually knowing what's going on there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so any kind of serious attempt of, of, to visualize that would be a huge help mm -hmm. yeah thanks for the insight i'm i'll send you a note uh, later again to i might have missed the names that you mentioned yeah sure i'm happy but, to yeah. I'd have a question about um, availability of open source code for modeling uh, or for singing voice synthesis. Is there any toolboxes that one can use out of the box? Um, I already had a bit of a look and it's uh, not that easy to find something. I think uh, Paulina would be probably uh, able to answer that question. But I think there's this, we have a list of uh, data sets, uh, right, for uh, singing Yes, we have a voice. list of data Sorry, uh, say it again. Uh, Sebastian, what were you looking for? Uh, I'm, I'm not looking for a data set, actually. I'm looking rather for um, code and Python implementations. And, uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, so at least in the in the work that I did so far in over here, I couldn't find any uh, direct implementations. I think there should be a lot of source code available for a lot of the the recent deep learning based methods for singing synthesis. Like I've uh, in the past, I've seen GitHub repositories like easily available for those, but for a lot of the physical modeling or the source filter modeling, I've not been able to find uh, easy source code. But I think there is uh, this one uh, toolbox from uh, from Karma, Stanford, where they have some tools for voice analysis, uh, like getting the LPC, getting the uh, piecewise waveguide uh, coefficients from LPC and things like those. I'll I can send you, you if you can send me a note. I can send you like the link to that toolbox. I'll have to look into my uh, inbox. It's there somewhere. That would be nice. Thank you. Mm, and and then one one other thing or one other question I have is um, uh, well, or yeah maybe you giving a bit of advice or a hint. Um, so let's assume I already have the source signal mm -hmm. um, and I just want to add basically the vocal track contribution. Mm -hmm. So what would you, what is the state of the art, so to say, uh, what would you use uh, for, for modeling just the vocal track when you already have a source signal? So if you in my uh, opinion, if you have, if you want the vocal tract to be like uh, a vocal tract from an existing recording, for example, then you could use one of uh, the techniques that I talked about previously, such as the GFM IAIF technique, or just the, the iterative adaptive 
filtering techniques or IAIF techniques. Uh, using that technique, you can get a vocal tract or an estimate for the vocal tract, which is kind of free from the influence of the glottal flow and the lip radiation. So then if you have the source signal, you can just use that uh, vocal tract. Depending on whether your source signal contains uh, the lip radiation or not, you would want to add that in as well. Okay. So if you have a source, I think you, you can find that out by just looking at the source signal. If the source signal looks like uh, just pulses, I can, maybe, yeah, if, if it looks like these pulses, like this, then it probably does not have the, the lip radiation. But if it looks something like this, it has like a, a discontinuity at the bottom, then uh, it is more likely to have uh, the lip radiation as a part of it. And these models are also publicly available or in some way or is it? The implementations for them, I don't think so. At least I couldn't, I didn't actually look a lot. I think I just implemented them myself uh, by looking at the, the paper. It was kind of easy to understand. So I'm, I'm happy to share my implementations with you if, if you uh, are interested. I don't have them on GitHub or something, but we can uh, talk about it over email. I'm happy to share what I have. Um, Let's keep in touch, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to. Thank you. What do you use for coding? Sorry? What do you use oh, for coding? Uh, for this work, I use uh, MATLAB, but I I'm, I've, I also use Python, but for this work, I've not used Python. <laughs> okay, so MATLAB is still in on that. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. I have a very naive question. You are using a linear model, mm -hmm. and it seems to perform fairly well in principle. Mm -hmm. uh, how about nonlinearities in the vocal tract? And don't they play an important role? Uh, physically, they should be there quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've I've not actually given a thought to it, but uh, yeah, I completely. Uh, understand and agree that there would be uh, non-linearities. I I'm not sure how much uh, of an important role they would play in the perception. Yeah. But for example, like I mean, there are there are some deep learning models now for uh, singing voice synthesis, and which do not necessarily estimate. Uh, any vocoder parameters, but just directly the signal. So they would take into account uh, the nonlinearities, I guess. But if we want to build a vocal track model that estimates any parameters for any of the vocoders, at least all the vocoders I know are all linear. Um, so even if, the, even if there are nonlinearities in the model itself, they will still estimate the linear parameters. So yeah, I'm not sure how to I mean, the only way I see to uh, uh, use the nonlinearities is to directly synthesize the signal, I think, using some uh, machine learning techniques which use nonlinear activations. But yeah, that's the best answer I have. <laughs> I have another question to all of you. Uh, are there any observational techniques to get at the glottal signal or at the, let's say, the, the resonance behavior of the vocal tract just by, I mean, measuring? Paulina, you probably are aware of what's going on there. Is there anything to actually map the, the vocal cavity so that one could use it as a physical model? I'm just dreaming. It's not nothing maybe very naive and completely crazy, but. I don't know. Do you mean like, are you scanning talking about? The, let's say like scanning the, the, the volume of the, the mouth and the whatever. Well, you can have, you can have various kinds of, you can have MRI for the one. Yeah, 
uh, that will give you the whole of the vocal chart. But if you are looking at the voice source, you would use some kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word for it? Um, endoscopy, there's another word. Two words actually, which I now forgot. Uh, happy to look it up. So that's something that Sundberg does a lot. Uh, you will find everything in his papers on this. Uh, how useful that is, is a diff different question. He also uses a mask to measure the subglottal pressure. Uh, but again, that's a kind of a quite an invasive technique. You can't really sing with it and measure the pressure at the same time. You can make like syllables. Mm -hmm. It's all very invasive and very, so like my interest in understanding what happens with the vocal tract during singing in real life performance, I think is still quite far away. So, because all these techniques are really lab based and quite invasive. Is that any answer to your question? I don't know. Well, it answers it in, a, in some way, as it tells me that the, there's not much out there in this case. I have, was just having a very crazy idea. I don't know if this is anything real. If I would just um, put a lot of sensors all around the head, and then I would measure what is going on during singing and would make beam forming. I was thinking of maybe one could uh, then beam form to the signal at the glottis and beam form to the signal of the vocal track and maybe subtract or separate those parts. This is ex actually what we are doing in seismology when we are putting arrays on the surface of the earth. So we can actually uh, focus our information on particular parts of the interior just by face shifting the individual recorders. I, I'm thinking if this would be possible with a human voice. Maybe it's not, but it's just in principle, it should be. Yeah, what if we have your larynx microphone and well, the actual well, thing? One, but we would need, let's say 20. And if we would place them all around the head, the signal coming from the glottis would have a different phase delay, let's say, directly to the to the larynx microphone, uh, as it would have, let's say, to the um, to a microphone to to one of those sensors which is on the top of the head or on the side, and one could correct for these phase delays, and in this way, the, all the signals not coming from the glottis would be would see destructive interference, and this way one could actually. Uh, steer the beams to all parts of the of the head but wouldn't uh, that be affected by the movement of the larynx it moves all the time it, it would not care about this it would just uh, let's say uh, make constructive interference uh, of all the signals coming from that direction not not a particular point okay. because uh, the the frequency um, of the of the larynx signal is not unlimited so it doesn't have infinitely high frequencies there so there should be some let's say limited uh, spatial resolution yeah. i don't know this is just thinking loud and and maybe dreaming yeah i was also kind of dreaming on my side of things uh, for example using something like infrared uh, to measure say the movement of the tongue and maybe of the larynx yeah uh, i don't know I heard, I, I can't say whether that has any prospect or not. But obviously there's still a lot of room for dreaming. <laughs> Which is a good thing yeah. for the ones. Yep. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for this very stimulating talk. And thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity. It was. It was, get good. it was very nice to get all your insights and uh, I'm going to send, I guess, emails to <laughs> all of you all to get uh, more information. Yeah, you're most welcome. There are not many of us, but I think you got the right people. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question to everyone. I've been, uh, let me stop the recording now. Um,